Welcome to Naval News. Today's news is brought to us from the United States Naval Institute news website. I recommend everyone go to usni.org and join and support the U.S. Naval Institute, as I have. I'm a member of them as well. Today's story is pretty important, and it's taken me a couple days to kind of digest and put together. But the title is uh, Fiscal Year 23, referring to 2023, Budget. Navy wants to shed 24 ships for a $3.6 billion savings over the next five years. The story brought to us by Mallory Shelbourne and a number of other authors that we're going to reference today uh, from USNI News. So full credit to them for breaking this. Okay, the Pentagon, the Navy wants to decommission 24 ships in the upcoming fiscal year to save $3.6 billion over a five-year span. Uh, As part of the fiscal year 2023 budget request, the Navy plans to decommission nine Freedom-class littoral combat ships, five Ticonderoga class cruisers, two LA 688 class submarines, uh, four landing dock ships, two oilers, and two expeditionary transfer dock ships. Now, the last uh, two of the last three uh, ships on there are very vital to uh, marine operations, and they are essentially being gutted in uh, terms of their at sea support vessels uh, with this plan. Um, back to the piece. Explaining the LCSD commissionings, the Navy Deputy Assistant Secretary Budget Rear Admiral John Gumbleton cited the service decision to abandon the anti-submarine warfare mission package for the LCS class because of the Constellation class frigate will have that capability. So we found out from uh, the budgeting office uh, via Admiral Gumbleton saying, quote, the problematic decision the programmatic, rather, programmatic decision uh, was actually looking at the ASW variant. The new ASW variant mission module has huge challenges, not going to work, and we're buying this budget for the fourth frigate. Uh, the fourth frigate has uh, what we believe is going to be an effective ASW capability. And so that's where we chose t- to take risk in our LCS portfolio. So that's a lot of admiral speak to Congress about some justification as to why we're getting rid of the littoral combat ship. We're get- Just to give you some history, the littoral, t- littoral combat ship is broken up into two types of ships. You have the independence class and you have the freedom class. And the freedom class, they're removing the entire class so uh, for savings. Now, the problems with the LCS have been well documented here on this channel, but they're using this ASW module and the problems that have come with that module as the reason for decommissioning the entire, the remaining Freedom Class. Even though some of these are less than 10 years old uh, ships, some of these are very new ships uh, and, and we are going to be getting rid of them. Let me go ahead and show you here some pictures of the ones that they're proposing getting rid of. It is the entire nine remaining vessels of this class here. And I'll have all these links in the description for you so you can look at them yourselves. But let's talk about the ASW module and why is that the reason why we're getting rid of the Freedom Class? Um, And then we'll talk about a lot of the other problems with, with the Freedom Class and why I don't think this is the reason. But back to this piece, this one was written by, give credit to the author, Sam Legrone, again from USNI News, writes, while it showed promise in early testing, referring to this ASW module, Raytheon built an ANSQS-62 variable depth sonar, suffered stability problems, and had towing issues with the Freedom Class, several Navy officers told USNI News. As a result of poor performance, the Navy announced that it terminated the mission module on Monday. A Raytheon spokesperson referred all questions on the sonar to the Navy um, because they don't want to go on public record. They're losing the contract, essentially. So, uh, Meredith Merger, who is, um, or Berger, who is the Undersecretary of the Navy right now, temporarily, said to Congress, as we look across the LCS, this is a place where we can identify that there are real costs, especially for the freedom class, uh, that are going to be able to make some repairs to it that are needed on those as we measure that against what is the best contribution to the capability that we need. Now, that sentence makes no sense, but what he's talking about is uh, he says that if we get rid of this entire class, we're going to be saving enough money to take that money and move it forward to the Constellation class, which is the next frigate, okay? Uh, and the ASW module is just one of six modules that these a, that these uh, LCS ships can perform. So if the ASW module is as bad as it actually is, it's terrible. It's, it's a horrible design. Um, 
they could still do five other missions. You wouldn't need to get rid of them just because the ASW module is not working very well. You know, you could still do the special ops. You could do the surface combat role that we really need right now in our Navy because we kind of don't have that on many of our ships. Um, Back to uh, the piece here, it says this is about opportunity cost. ASW mission that went away uh, roughly $50 million a year in support for these vessels and the opportunity to reinvest $1.8 billion when this ASW mission sets are going to be taken up by the frigate. That's talking about the Constellation class. So look at how much money we're spending per year, $50 million supporting these vessels. And we're going to reap uh, you know, $1.8 billion that we can put towards the Constellation class, which will have an actual towed sonar system. So let's take a look at what these sonar systems are. This is the Raytheon Dart. This is the ANSQS 62 VDS, brand new sonar system, uh, very classified, but since we're not using it anymore, uh, we now have pictures and stuff is coming becoming public about it. A lot of this is from the, um, a lot of these pictures are from Raytheon. These are just promotional, but this is VDS built for the least amount of cost by the developers so they can keep the rest of the money for themselves. That's the first problem with this. The design itself, you can just look at this and see that this is very unstable. This red rudder, if you will, the stabilizer, is in the center of the piece where the center of uh, gravity is gonna be for this thing that you're towing. Anytime you put a stabilizer next to the center of gravity, you're gonna have a lot of instability. In in describing the sonar, they say, hey, it's highly maneuverable. Yeah, it's highly maneuverable because it's unstable. In any kind of sea state and towing it at any speeds, I don't know, greater than eight knots maybe, uh, it's going to be all over the place in any sea state. So this design is just flawed. Obviously, you want to have the stabilizer at the rear end if you're towing it from the front. But look, they're towing it from the middle, the stabilizer's in the middle, and you've got weight forward and weight aft. This this would not pass collegiate level engineering classes, much less how did Raytheon authorize this? How did this perform well in early testing? What kind of test did they put this under? Did they even bother towing it in a simulator? Because this is a horrible idea. Let's take a look at what a real um, cap task looks like or a towed sonar array right here. This is the one that's built by Thales, used by the Royal Navy. This is the one that they say they're gonna put on the next generation of frigate. This is the stabilizer. Notice how it's behind the toad body because it was designed by engineers who graduated math class in high school. So they have this, this thing is bigger than a person. I've, I've been on board these, I've seen these myself. I've stood next to this thing and it's bigger than I am in certain terms of height. And then this is the projector body right here for CapTAS. Uh, we have a better picture right here, a little bit closer up to it. Um, I have some pictures myself, maybe I can share sometime. Uh, but this looks like one of mine. <laughs> I, I have a picture very similar to this. Uh, but no, no, notice how the towed body is uh, is is well forward of of the stabilizer here and this projector. And because you don't have a good uh, comparison or reference, you really can't sense from this picture how big this thing is. It's huge. It's very large, and it's also a hell of a lot more stable than whatever the hell this was. Yeah, th th this was a, a, a just a poorly designed, cheaply built unstable piece of crap. And one of the reasons why you need a, st a stable platform when you're projecting sonar is you need to know where your array is at all times so that whenever you get a return from that active sonar, you can measure the distances. So if you're projecting sonar from something that's flopping around like a dead fish underwater as you tow it, you know, you're not going to get accurate bearings. You're not going to get accurate ranges. You know, this thing was a, a mess. And I strongly suspect that the initial tests were not very rigorous tests. And how this got approved has a lot more to do with the name of the company than the performance of the device that they built. Anyway, that's not why they got rid of the LCS. That's a red herring. That's a convenient excuse. The problem with the LCS was that combining gear, which they go on to say in this piece, the Admiral, uh, that the combining gears, despite taking years to fix these nine ships uh, with by bringing them into dry dock and replacing it, wasn't going to cost that much. And that was not the primary reason for, get for getting rid of these. It was this ASW module, which is complete bunk. The real reason besides the combining gear is that the manning and automation that were integral to selling this 
designed to Congress in the early 2000s never panned out. These ships are critically undermanned for the job they're expected to do. Um, the crew in the beginning wasn't expected to do any maintenance on any of the gear, so they didn't really understand their ship other than if they hit the button, they get the banana. That was their level of expertise in terms of operation, and they did not necessarily have any incentive to care for their ship because they did not have to maintain the equipment. And uh, that with the combined gear. Oh, and then finally automation. There was this heralded automation program associated with the LCS program, both independence and freedom class that would automatically order parts uh, before they wore out, you know, so the parts would arrive on the pier and be installed by uh, contractors, not the Navy sailors. And so the ship would always be in top notch form. And that, that automation was going to be make the supply side of things a lot easier. Well, their estimates on the automation were grossly overestimated as to how long parts would last. For instance, if you had a part that they estimated would last six months being replaced twice a year, every six months, it, it, it often wouldn't work past say four months. So they would need three parts a year, not two parts a year, these additional parts, and then not going according to plan really disrupted this automation that they had uh, associated with this program. And it wasn't really automation as much as it was a timer. They just had a bunch of timers order this part because the time is now up and the timing estimates were uh, about as well engineered as this thing by the people who designed them. The parts wore out long before they were expected to. So, and on top of that, that uh, combining gear cost going into dry dock and all that, I don't care what the Admiral says, that is extremely expensive in money. And then also time, it was going to take more than five years to get the uh, combining gear fix on all nine of these. So that's why they're going away. This bunk about an ASW module is good information. I'm glad we can finally talk about how terrible this thing is. I'm glad we can do that, but let's not blame the loss of an entire class of ship on a poorly engineered uh, sonar system, okay? There's a lot more going wrong with LCS than just that. Now, let's go back to the... Uh, the list of ships that we're going to be getting rid of today. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, back to the list of ships here. Uh, we have the five Ticonderoga class cruisers that are being decommissioned. Um, these girls were built in the 1980s. They're long in the tooth. Uh, recently, they've been poorly maintained, in my opinion. And it's probably time for them to go. Uh, it's sad that we could not have had the foresight or we did not have the foresight to build replacements for the Ticonderoga because we're decommissioning these while we're continuing to reduce the size of the Navy instead of building replacements for these, the, the, these five ships. Now, the closest thing we have to the Ticonderoga in terms of performance is the Arleigh Burke class destroyer, of which we build two a year. So that continues, thank God. But we are decommissioning these much faster than we are replacing them with anything that is as capable as the uh, Ticonderoga class was. And that's those five right there. The um, LSDs, we're going to get into the Marine Corps here a little bit. So the LSDs are key to Marine operations because these are the ships where the Marines, one of the many, by the way, but one of the many ships that the Marines stay on board while they're at sea. Uh, and then that's where they keep a lot of their equipment. And then the LSDs, this is a docking ship where they can, you know, dock and undock their little amphibious or transport crafts to get to the beaches, right? And do their Marine thing. Well, we're going to be decommissioning, you know, a bunch of these right here. The Gunston, uh, the Tortuga, the Ashland, all going away. It looks like four of them. And then uh, down here at the very end, we have the USNS Munford Point and the John Glenn. These are two very new ship designs and absolutely critical to support long-term marine operations ashore. These are sea base marine bases. They have command and control capability, uh, all of the communications gear that they need to integrate with other uh, nations like NATO nations or nations that we work with in the Pacific theater as well, as well as the provides equipment housing for a lot of the equipment like you see here. Uh, they can dock their uh, amphibious landing craft right on this thing. And these are very large tanker-like structures that have been converted to support Marines in the field. These are floating bases are what these two ships are. And they're only seven or eight years old. They were built in 2013, 2014. Now, not very old at all, getting rid of these. What's the problem with these? I don't see any excuses about a module being broken. Why don't we need these ships? The Marines certainly need these ships. 
You know, we, we have a cadre of retired generals, uh, some 24 retired Marine generals are protesting the removal or decommissioning of these ESDs and the LSDs, because this is fundamentally changing uh, how the Marines operate. They're going to be much more dependent on shoreside supply. And when you're, you know, when you don't own the shore, you aren't going to get, get supplies from them. So it's going to just going to make them more vulnerable on the beach. And that argument goes much deeper than that and is very well documented or uh, being presented by those retired Marine generals much better than I could. One of those is a retired general Mattis. You may remember his name. Uh, he is, he is a well-respected general who, who is now retired. So we're getting rid of 24 of these ships. And I want to show you the graph here. Um, okay, so here is what new ship construction looks like over the next five years. In uh, 2022, we're going to be building 13 ships. And this is going to be the last time. This year is going to be the last time we do that for a very long time. Because in 2023, we're doing nine. Uh, 24 is nine ships. 225 is nine ships. Keep in mind, uh, while the Navy is saying our primary adversary is China, and we need to be preparing for that, China is building you know, twice as many ships as we're building, if not more. Yeah, m m almost three times as many ships as we're building uh, over the next couple of years here. In 2026, we finally get some... Um Tago ships uh, added back to the fleet. So that brings our number up to 13 for one year. And then it goes back down again to, to 11 ships being built in one year. Now, one thing that is consistent and very important is down here at the bottom. And that's the Virginia class and the Arleigh Burke class. We're getting to each of those every year. Okay. And those, those are the backbone of our Navy's strike capability right now in both ASW and uh, force projection ashore in uh, both Arleigh Burke and, and the Virginia. But what we really need to be doing is thinking about bringing these Constitution frigates on board a little bit faster if we can. Uh, I know right now we're going to have two uh, finished in 2024, but they are not expected to be operational until 2030. So there's going to be, you know, a, a four to six year gap between we actually see them deployed with the fleet. What's going to fill that gap? Well, additional deployments with our current assets. And that's what brings us to uh, the fleet tracker here. As of today, before we decommission any of these ships, we have 298 uh, active duty ships in our battle force. Okay. Well, that's going to be reduced by about 24 ships. And then we're going to be building during that time. So even though it'll go down a little bit, it'll bounce back a little bit. The point is the trajectory of the number of ships we have in our battle force over the next five years is descending, not ascending uh, to, to save a lot of money. $3.6 billion is a lot of money, but we are making ourselves vulnerable over the next four to five years with reduced capability. So hopefully nothing really kicks off Navy wise over, the, over that time frame because we're not going to have the force we have today to be able to respond to it.